This tutorial looks at the two final parts of the C3 specification. The first part of the tutorial is about giant molecular structures and simple molecular structures and the difference in their properties. And the second part is about fullerenes and nanotubes, their uses and the properties that they have which make them suitable for these uses. So starting on these giant molecular structures, you need to explain why diamond and graphite have got such structures and then widen this out to be able to predict and explain the properties of other substances that have similar structures. Well, although we can't draw a giant molecular structure, we can only draw a section of it. These are all giant molecular structures. On the left here we have diamond. Diamond has each carbon atom joined to four other carbon atoms uh, in a structure that goes on in millions and billions of atoms in all directions. Graphite also has a giant structure because although these hexagonal sections are shown quite small, each of these would have hexagons going out in all directions um, and that would uh, continue for millions or billions of atoms. And another uh, giant molecular structure is this one on the right which is silicon oxide which is found in sand. Silicon oxide also has a giant molecular structure with these alternate silicon and oxygen atoms in this structure that goes on for very millions and billions of atoms. So giant molecular structures all have huge structures containing many millions of atoms usually held together uh, certainly in these cases by strong covalent bonds. Generally speaking, these giant molecular structures have similar properties. For example, they tend to have very high melting points because they need a large amount of energy in order to break the very, very many strong covalent bonds in their structure to make separate atoms. They tend to be insoluble in water because the uh, covalent bonds are so strong they're not interested in breaking to make attractions with water molecules or other solvents. They don't tend to conduct electricity because they don't tend to have free electrons or ions um, to carry current, although graphite is an exception here. Graphite does conduct electricity because it's uh, free or delocalized electrons. And they also tend to be hard. And again, this is because of the strong covalent bonds which hold the atoms together and don't allow them to break off. Here's a past paper question. Silicon carbide, or SIC, is used in cutting tools. Look at the diagram. It shows the structure of silicon carbide. And I think you can see the similarity between this and the structure of diamond, which we've looked at before. Silicon carbide and diamond have got similar structures. Silicon carbide has a high melting point. So just why? Using ideas about this structure of silicon carbide. Well, I'm going to say that it has very many. strong covalent bonds which would need a lot of energy let's say a lot of heat energy to break Secondly, silicon carbide is used in cutting tools. One reason for this is that it has a high melting point. Suggest one other reason why silicon carbide is used in cutting tools. I would say that it is hard. And again, this would be because of the strong covalent bonds within its structure. And here's the answer. Uh, one mark for the idea that the structure's got very many bonds that need to be broken, and one mark for the idea that these bonds would be very strong. And secondly, um, Silicon carbide would be very hard, uh, which would allow it to be used as a cutting tool. You could also have that uh, it is a good conductor of heat. But don't get mixed up between hard and strong. They're two different things. Hard means it will scratch other things. It's the opposite of soft, whereas strong is the opposite of weak, which means it is uh, able to take a lot of weight before it breaks. Now we've looked at giant molecular structures. Here's some examples of simple molecular structures and these are fullerenes. Fullerenes are balls of carbon atoms which are arranged in this sort of fashion and these are individual molecules which have got a particular formula. Now although the bonds within those balls are very strong there are only very weak attractions between one and its neighbors and therefore these tend to have very low melting points. 
An example of one of these simple molecules, these fullerenes, is Buckminster fullerene, which has got 60 carbons in the ball, uh, identical structure to that football there, and these are used in drug delivery systems amongst other uses. Although this isn't on this specification, if you've ever wondered why they're called Buckminster Fullerene Balls, they're named after uh, an architect called Richard Buckminster Fuller, who made large geodesic domes such as this one. Now on to the use of these allotropes of carbon, fullerenes and nanotubes, and relating the uses to their structure. As I said before, these fullerenes, like Buckminster Fullerene, have got um, a ball-like structure and that enables atoms or molecules to be trapped inside these like a ball in a cage. And chemists have been able to use these as drug delivery systems. Uh, for example, a radioactive atom might be placed inside the ball and then the ball coated with a chemical which attracts cancer cells then injected into the body, the ball will make a beeline towards cancer cells and stick there and only deliver the radioactive dose to those cancer cells and not to the whole body. Um, other drugs might be attached to the outside or the inside of the ball and then delivered to specific parts of the body. Carbon nanotubes are like the individual sheets of graphite which have been rolled up into a tube and as you probably appreciate tubes are one of the strongest structures so these make very strong structures but also because the bonds within those hexagons are very strong covalent bonds we have got a very strong tube in both directions end to end and also um, across the tube as well. Um, because it has the same structure as graphite um, and it's only making three bonds for each carbon atom that leaves one electron per carbon atom um, unused and that allows this structure also to conduct electricity in the same way that graphite does. These nanotubes like buckyballs can be used as vessels for drug delivery for the same kind of reasons. But specifically, you need to know that the nanotube can be used uh, for catalysts. Catalysts work best when they've got a very large surface area, and these nanotubes do have a very large surface area and also allow catalyst atoms to be attached to the surface. So the nanotube catalyst could be used, for example, in fuel cells of the future. And here's another past paper question. Buckminster fullerene and nanotubes are recently discovered substances. Look at the diagrams. They show the structures of Buckminster fullerene and a nanotube. Write down two reasons why nanotubes are used as catalysts. Well, the first reason is that they have a large surface area. And the second reason is that the catalyst can be attached to the surface. Buckminster fullerene can cage other molecules. Describe one use of caged molecules. A simple term, drug delivery systems will do here. And here's the answers. Sadly, on this slide, the two answers are in the wrong order. So first of all, for the first part, why can nanotubes be used as catalysts? Because they've got a large surface area, said that. Because uh, the catalyst can be attached, said that. And also, you could have had that the reacting molecules can't escape. Um, you could also cage molecules, enable more collisions to happen between particles. Other acceptable answers are there. And for the second part, um, the use of the buckyball to supply drugs or allow chemical reactions to take place inside the cage is the acceptable answer. But they also allow that it can act as a catalyst, even though it's not on the specification.